My name is Wyatt Graham, and I'm joined with Ron Dart, and we're going to talk, I think, primarily about politics and also about Jordan Peterson. So we'll see exactly how the conversation goes from that to that. It might be organic or it might not be. I guess we'll see. As we get going, Ron, would you mind introducing yourself in a way that you feel would be helpful for people who maybe don't know you and are tuning into this conversation? Okay, Wyatt, I'll say just a few things. I've taught at uh, University of the Fraser Valley. It's in Abbotsford, British Columbia for over 30 years. And in the 1980s, I was on staff with Amnesty International. Uh, I teach in the area of political science or political philosophy, philosophy and religious studies. I helped start the religious studies um, courses at University of the Fraser Valley. That was back when it was Fraser Valley College days. Uh, published about 40 books and reams of articles in the area of spirituality, religion, theology, politics. Uh, my background is in the old humanist tradition, the Renaissance humanist tradition that you would find in someone like a C.S. Lewis or uh, to some degree you'll find in Roger Scruton also. Uh, maybe we can talk about him as we go on, but it's that old Christian humanist heritage that was passed on through the best of Christian philosophy, theology, arts, culture, literature, politics. So uh, just a brief overview then, like a little fox, that's probably all you need at this point. Well, that's helpful. Um, so I'm actually really excited to talk to you, probably more than you expect, because I have, uh, over the past few years, um, we've had all these like political things in North America. So the U.S. is a bit more obvious with some of the division there. I lived in the U.S. for a long time as well. Uh, there's obviously a similar thing happening in Canada. And I always found myself sort of like, I, at least in Canada, I don't really have like an, or in the US to an obvious political party that I just gravitate towards. I think this this last election, I said the, the conservative party includes me in their platform where maybe the liberals don't include me. So that was kind of like where I was at, you know, <laughs> you know, at that very basic level. But I've been kind of reading to understand things a little better. So I've been reading Roger Scruton, who you mentioned. I just finished um, George Grant's uh, The Lament, Lament of a Nation. Um, I'm planning to read your book. Uh, I can't remember the full title, but it's on high Toryism. Um, and more and more after this, I'm interested to talk to you about this. So it, it might be, oh, and then also I didn't know this, but Richard Hooker is one of my favorite thinkers, but I didn't realize how important he was for, um, political thinking. Mm. Obviously he is, he's mentioned by so many people. George Grant mentions him. I think Roger Scruton does. I believe you do in your book as well. Um, because I talked to my brother about it, who has read your book. So it's just really, really interesting. So maybe I could just start by asking you, uh, what is high Toryism? And like, what is like this big conservative tradition that's out there that most of us, myself included, barely know about? And why don't we know about it? No, wonderful, wonderful uh, combination of questions and reflections. I might just add one of my former teachers, uh, actually at lunch with them a couple of weeks ago, is uh, Paul Stanwood, who's one of the top scholars of Hooker in the world. Paul is now in his late 80s. So it was uh, lovely to be with him. And, and George Grant begins Lament for a Nation, as you're probably aware, with a quote from Hooker himself. Grant had a great respect for the laws of ecclesiastical polity, and Paul Stanwood you know, was the laws very well. He taught 16th, 17th century literature as well, lives in Vancouver. But yeah, I think one of the underlying dilemmas most people today face is the illness of memoricide, uh, no memory. <laughs> and it makes, it makes them very vulnerable to anybody who's posturing political, religious, theological, economic positions. And when a Per, uh, Noam Chomsky, I've had a long correspondence with Chomsky over the, uh, the years, and one of his comments is that um, memory is a form of intellectual defense. Without memory, a person can be, as Orwell would said, manipulated to believe anything they want. And the dilemma of high Toryism is that it has suffered the fate uh, of a progressive notion of liberalism, a Hegelian understanding of liberalism, the dialectic ever, ever forward. So the, the past itself is not quite at the same level as the emerging present and future into an understanding of consciousness of liberty. And so it's a lesser level, which then means why learn about the past? Because it's not quite at the level of our present 
liberal understanding of what is good and true and beautiful. So I think one of the first casualties of um, liberalism is memoricide of which high Toryism as a worldview in terms of religion and politics and education and philosophy has uh, suffered seriously. And so part of my book, The North America, well, I've done 10 books on high Toryism in which I look at the Canadian story, going back to uh, John Strawn, Jacob Mountain, Bishop Ingalls, Maritimes, coming up through Stephen Leacock, George Grant, Donald Creighton, Eugene Ford, a whole, you know, there's a great novelist, Robertson Davies, Maza de la Roche, the novelist, is that there's a whole story there that most Canadians, much less Americans, know nothing about. And that's the problem of memoricide. So trying to remember, as it were, put the members of the story back together again, it's, a, it's an ongoing task. And so my recent book, The North American High Tory Tradition, is an attempt in an imperfect, suggestive sort of way to say there's a story here that has been buried in the cemetery of history, but it was this very story that created Canada. And it's this very story coming out of the Mediterranean through England, through France, that in fact uh, built up Western civilization as well. And as we face all sorts of challenges today, we do need some sort of story to interrogate the sort of orthodoxy of liberalism or progressivism. One thing that's really interesting to me that I think connects what you're saying is, I believe George Grant makes this point that if the loyalists who came to Canada uh, after the, the American Revolutionary Wars didn't have something to add that was different than what was happening there, then there's no, really no point in turning back to this period of history to recover and to understand it. But it does seem like if there is this kind of bigger high Toryism, which I guess gets split into blue and red Tory later, um, there is something there to recover, to remember, and to understand, to to at least figure out where we are. Um, for me, it was incredibly useful to kind of understand some of these categories to, to make sense of what conservatism is in, in Canada in particular and in the US. So even really, I mean, you might disagree with this analysis because I'm obviously an amateur where you've done research, but just the, uh, the US, you could be Republican, but you're actually more similar to like the earlier liberals in terms of individual freedom than you would be to what original conservatives were, for example. And the same thing almost seems true in Canada after um, 2003, when there's the alliance with the Western East, when we became, uh, I guess people call it more blue Tory, but the idea would be we're a little bit more like the, the Americans in terms of Republican conservatism. So I, I know that's maybe a very simplistic way to put it, but for me, it's been helpful to kind of just begin to see those categories and maybe to understand why I feel um, maladjusted politically, <laughs> because I like, I like a guy like a Richard Hooker or some of the more reformed thinkers, even earlier than that as well. And they don't really seem to, to speak to what's happening in North American politics today. So am I kind of scratching an itch that's connecting to what you're saying or? No, excellent, excellent points. Yeah, I mean, what's often called conservatism today is an attempt to conserve what we call first generation liberalism, uh, the liberalism of John Locke to some degree of Burke, more extreme Thomas Paine, uh, as that works its way out in the Canadian and the American experiment, both pre 1776 and afterwards. And so, but Toryism goes back of Locke and Burke and Smith and Hume and Hooker is a lovely portal that takes you into classical Christian thought that you would get in an Aquinas or an Eckhart or an Augustine or you know in a Bonaventure or a Hildegard or a Macrina Eastern Father and they take you then back to Aristotle and Plato and the Greek tragedians and Homer, Virgil. So when most people hear the word conservatism today they're not again it's the problem of a civilizational memoricide Hmm. And of course, what happens amongst the progressive tribe uh, or clan in that sense, the past is only seen in a negative way. You constantly pick on the inadequacies, the faults, the faux pas without realizing, no, there's a massively, a massive mountain here of insight and wisdom. And it's not all dark and dour and dreary. In fact, there's brilliant shafts of light in the women in men of the past as well. But it, we talk to most Republicans and conservatives in terms of their memory. It's really just a memory 
for those who even have a minimal memory beyond just a, a sort of a shallow blue conservatism in Canada or variations of republicanism. It's more the Lockean, uh, Burkean pain as it plays itself, some out in the Federalists in the States, but in, in Canada, it's, uh, it's of that same ilk. And there's been a whole movement in Canada to say we have no Toryism. We're all just, um, you know, younger and weaker brothers of the big liberal tradition to the south of us as it pulls in either social um, liberal direction, greater state involvement, or more um, a weaker state and more power to the individual, which Republicans tend to prize much more. So, but those are just two kids in the same liberal family, really. And so the questions you're asking are quite apt. And, you know, the arrow hits the bull's arc quite well. Is there a story older than the Reformation? And if it's someone like a hooker is referring back to that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, when you read the laws, he's drawing constantly from the great cloud of witnesses in the classical tradition, Greek or Roman, and then obviously the synthesis in the uh, Christian tradition of the, the East and the West. Well, I think it's even interesting, one of the civic virtues of, of piety, but we would never almost almost none of us would say like piety is a civic virtue of any sort <laughs> like, like meaning that's a sort of religious thing that is separate and distinct from the political order and uh, if, as long as you do it privately or at least with your group it's sort of it doesn't really matter kind of what's going on so there's things like that where i know like for example hooker or others richard hooker would see a, a tighter connection between piety religion and um all that the, the state is. Whereas today we, we make those things really distinct. Um, and I kind of have to wonder, um, well, maybe you could help me with this. Uh, if, if you're a red Tory, my understanding is that you're able to kind of bring these things more together. You don't necessarily have these hardline distinctions. You can bring kind of the religious traditions together, the cultural traditions together, and you view it as more of a, of a larger thing that you receive and can work through. So. For example, conservatives founded like the CBC, the Bank of Canada, and so on. I think you even had a Methodist pastor, if I remember this right, who helped to institute um, national health care in Canada. So today, though, we would, uh, many who, who are Christians or at least religious, think of these things as being bad or liberal. And the true conservatives you might find are those who are part of like the People's Party of Canada, who are uh, libertarian, essentially. Um, that's just kind of, a, it's, it's almost like a disconnect. And I guess you're talking about this, this, uh, this lack of memory that we kind of forget what it meant to be conservative. And in fact, you could be a genuinely religious or a Christian person and be okay with some of the more, I guess, uh, top down social control. So can you kind of like bring those ideas together? Like what is the red blue Tory difference? What is high Toryism and how does that kind of differ from our conception of it today? Because I, I don't think it's clear, at least in many people's minds. Yeah, so what's called blue conservatism, say in Canada, or variations of republicanism in the United States, there's a certain um, suspicion of the state and the role of the state, except in areas, of course, of policing and militarism, because the way you can lose your freedom is either crime from within or invasions from without. So they don't mind having a strong state when it comes to military or policing, and a lot of money goes into it. But beyond that, whether it's market economy or education or um, any other area of life, um, individuals are expected to use their freedom um, without the support of the state. And um, whereas in Toryism, there's always been a sense that there has to be a working together of state and society, the civic sphere and the state to provide the common good or the common wheel or the common wealth. And it should never be state versus society, either idealizing a society and demonizing the state, or if you go further left, idealizing the state and demeaning society. Both have important contributions to make to the common good, and both, both can go sour uh, as well. And so a Tory, and this is where my book is on high Toryism, not red Toryism, because the language of red Tory came in the mid 60s after Grant did Lament for a Nation, and Gad Howaritz couldn't quite understand what Grant was talking about because he wasn't a Goldwater type 
um, a Republican who thought the state was the problem, and here's Grant arguing at a you know provincial and federal level for the important role of the state, CBC, you know, healthcare, affordable education, and a whole variety of things. And for Howard, uh, this was well, what kind of a conservative are you? Because his understanding of conservatism was a weaker state, less taxes, market economy. Um, and so but Grant was the other kind, so was he, what was he? Uh, and so Howard's penned the term a red Tory. Mm -hmm. Now Howard's came from, there was a whole movement in the 60s in Canada of, called the Waffle move, Movement in the NDP. Hmm. Um, David Lewis was the head of the NDP and the Waffle said, we'd rather waffle to the left than waffle to the right. And many people thought the NDP was waffling to the right and those who waffled to the left with a strong state, higher taxes, more engagement with the state in distributive measures, um, they were red nationalists in Canada and Grant had a nationalist bent as well. So Howard's just called him a red Tory. Mm -hmm. Grant said, well, first of all, your understanding of red is much more leaning toward a socialist and communist. And he says, I'm not that. Um, and so, but he said, I am a Tory and Tories are strong on not nationalism in terms of what it means in terms of Plato's grappling with justice, what Augustine was doing in the city of God, how Aquinas was grappling with that, what Thomas More and Erasmus was thinking through, what Hooker was up to. And so um, one has to distinguish in Canadian, well, Anglo-Canadian and Franco-Canadian history between blue conservatism, which is really liberal it's that first generation, 16th, 17th yeah. century liberalism, and then social liberalism comes along uh, and begins to call into question that in terms of issues as well as the state society. Um, the reaction to blue is often goes leftist thought, which is red thought. And so Toryism finds a via media, hooker style, hmm. between red and blue, and it's high, high Toryism. <laughs> and so my book tries to find what is the via media, I'm not right and I'm not left. And it's not that, you know, high Toryism sits on the fence. It doesn't sit on the fence no more than Jesus did in his time. He wasn't a Pharisee, he wasn't a Sadducee, he wasn't a Zealot, he wasn't a Herodian, he wasn't a Samaritan. So who are you? You know, but when people think just binaries, this or that, so are you left or you're right? Well, Toryism is neither, but it has affinities with elements of the right and affinities with elements of the left. So it's high, uh, it transcends the tribalism of that. That's helpful. And I think uh, living in the U.S., when it comes to politics, you you begin to think of binaries because at least there, you're either basically Republican or, or Democrat. I don't, there are some smaller parties, but really that's kind of how it's all divided. And I think in Canada, it's a little bit like that, but because of the parliamentary system, you, you feel like there's enough diversity where you could vote green or NDP or, or whatever and have some represent, representation. Okay, now you're talking about high Toryism. I think that helps to clarify it a little bit. It may be a simple way for me to think about it. It's it's a set of assumptions and things that you've received from the past that are wise and helpful for uh, conserving beauty. Um, I'll let you define however you want to in, in a bit. Um, but, but you did mention something. You mentioned the, the common good or common wheel. And it seems to me that to have the common good as, a, as an end to pursue at one level, you can't be a libertarian or else the common good is sort of your, your sort of individual <laughs> desire. Uh, but on the other end, you sort of need to have a view that something like natural law exists and that you can discern it, or at least that there are something stable that you can receive by which you can figure out what the common good is. So if you're a high Tory, how do you discern the common good, the end to which you organized society? Well, Toryism starts with the possession that to be human, we have certain common needs, regardless of whether a person's right, left, or center. Um, how we achieve and get those needs be met becomes an important issue. Does society provide for them? Does the state um, so whether a person's right, and this is what divides right and left, is how does one meet those basic perennial common needs? I mean, a basic thing is um, if we're, for example, through business polluting the world uh, and we're in a situation of global warming, 
um, nobody wants to be the victim of fires and floods and unpredictable weather. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, we all, whether we're left, right or center, want to some degree an environment in which we can all live safely and healthily in. Um, and so what is the role of society and the state? And so that's not a, an issue. We all do need housing. We're in situations of illness. We do need a, a medical you know, profession to help us. Education does play an important role in enriching a person's journey. So it should be made affordable to assist people, not only in formation, but learning technical skills as well as humanities in its best sense. So a Tory starts from the position, um, there is certain basic longings, needs that everyone has crossed the board. Now people are going to interpret that differently uh, but what are those and where can people work together on common issues while recognizing there's obviously going to be different interpretations of what those issues are and how, how you um, deal with them at a political level, at a federal, in Canada, provincial, municipal level. And the dilemma we face today is people overemphasize the fragment, fragmentary nature of identity politics and we have nothing in common whatsoever. Well, if that's the case, you can't build a nation, you can't build a community if everyone defines reality or in their own private micro way. Uh, Tories recognize that in fact, there is there are reasons, and you mentioned natural law, of course, everything hinges on how a person interprets natural law too. There's leftist reads of that, there's centrist and there's right reads, but we do have a, a share of a certain human nature. And um, Tory's attempt to articulate what that is and then how through the use of society and the state can that be maintained without slipping into libertarianism or totalitarianism. You know, one leads total fragmentation, the other leads to an unhelpful centralization. Um, but there's good in those extremes, but a Tory lives in tension, which is not always easy to live with. And in my High Tory manifesto in my book, High Tory Tradition, I look at 10 points of which the tension has to exist. And when it gets broken, that's where you get increasing fragmentation. Hmm. Okay, so that's helpful. So it is at one level, then there are a set of needs that we all have. So you could say like food, water, shelter, some kind of basic things like that. And so what you're attempting to do as a Tory is to understand how to fulfill those needs, support people in them on the basis of some sort of common agreement on, on these needs. Um, but as you noted, there are, there are differences. There are people who would say, it's kind of, I don't, I don't fully understand this in Canada, but there is a, a segment of people currently today who are really emphasizing a sort of libertarian view once again. I haven't seen that uh, in Canada until recently. So maybe it's through all this pandemic stuff that's kind of really being pushed. I think in the US that has also increased a lot in terms of like public rhetoric. I wonder if that's part of it. So, so maybe it might be helpful. Like let's talk about one, one issue and I'll tell you how, how I'm trying to understand it. And then maybe you can tell me how you understand it from your kind of political experience. That's the question of, of like a vaccine passport system. I bring this up because I think it's everyone's maybe thinking about it, so it's a little bit easier to talk about. So you could come at it from two angles. Someone could say, well, we have a settlement in Canadian society, which means we all contribute to the national health care and all this kind of stuff, or provincial. And uh, because of the settlement, we need to be able to protect and each other. And we have a duty or an obligation to society, just as society has a duty or obligation to us. So it makes good reason for me to say, get vaccinated, be part of this system. On the other hand, people might say, well, I understand that maybe vaccinations are good, um, that you want to prevent harm and all this kind of stuff, but I haven't personally agreed to support my neighbor who lives 500 kilometers away. And what's most important to me is my sort of individual liberty and freedom to choose. And I, I'm going to choose no to something like this because I don't feel any obligation uh, to partake of the sort of medical procedure and so on. To me, um, I feel like both people could be conservative who are saying these things. The first group could be someone who's maybe more of a 
maybe a traditional conservative who views a greater obligation to society. The second person might be a newer conservative who's more kind of an individual liberty or Republican type of person. So like based on what, I mean, obviously you can read however you want into what I've said. How do you kind of process those two approaches? Like where are they, are they both conservative? Is, is there really a conservative case for like a vaccine passport system? Or is that mainly one of those things that's ambiguous and it's kind of up to different people to make up their minds on? Like, how do you process something like that? I know it's kind of maybe putting you on the spot, but it is kind of one of those issues that everybody's thinking about. So it might be helpful to hear a sort of analysis on that question. Oh, it's a very good question. And it's very pertinent in terms of applying certain Tory principles to obviously a hot button issue that everyone faces. I would say both the libertarian and the person who's more communitarian, um, they both are right and they're both are wrong <laughs> so, uh, in that sense. And I'm not trying to evade the issue. Um, you can go back to say Sophocles, Antigone or something, the clash between Antigone and Creon um, and the tragedy of, of course, what Sophocles is doing is that Antigone pushes her, her position of individual liberty and the right to make my decision in terms of burying my brother to the point in Creon is, as we say, would say today, the head of the state or, you know, the head of his city state. And he says, well, there's the common good you have to think about as well. Your brother was a traitor and we have to um, deal with that. And if we give him, we fet him and give him all the honors of a burial, what's that gonna say about how we understand traitors? But he's my brother, she argues, and I have the right to do what I want. And it's, it's the, the tension is always, uh, how does one honor the significance of the individual and their conscience on the one hand while recognizing what are the limitations of that and how does one recognizing the importance of the common good or the organic common good and what are the limitations of that now we do know in society uh, we again and again accept the fact that the individual uh, constrains themselves again and again for the common good. You don't drive on the left side of the road because you, I have the freedom to do that. That's going to cause harm to one and all. We talk, we wear, you know, seat belts in the car. We tax people for certain things. Um, uh, a few years ago, you know, everyone used to smoke quite generously in a restaurant. Laws came in and said, no, these, you know, smoking and secondhand smoking does have an effect on other people's health. They end up going in hospital, it raises the cost of the healthcare system. And, uh, and so it affects everyone. And so the notion of the, uh, the atomistic individual that is in no way connected to anyone else or the choices have no consequences for anyone else, that's a pure fantasy because we do know we are part um, explicitly and implicitly so of a broader community and our decisions have consequences for other people. Um, and so it's how one lives in this tension, um, a certain form of libertarianism, they often are very inconsistent because again and again, they recognize their liberty is contingent on accepting an order. So they drive on the right side of the road uh, hopefully they don't um, overdrink when they drive. They put seat belts on. They pay taxes if they want to go to the hospital. They, uh, you know, they get in and in Canada anyway, uh, free because the nation supports the system. Um, um, smoking, you don't do it in public because it causes illnesses, which up the cost of a healthcare system that everyone pays into. Um, so the problem of the libertarian position, uh, the downside is they're constantly living off an order. And then occasionally they'll raise their hands and say, I want my freedom on this issue um, without recognizing your freedom on a, a healthcare issue such as vaccine is going to have an impact. We have a variety of friends actually who were some of my students uh, who in fact, you know, they were anti-vax, anti-masks, they get COVID, they're in the hospital for three months and they die. Mm -hmm. um, but even if they hadn't died, who would be paying all those healthcare costs because they wanted to use their liberty and exercise it in a way that they didn't have to um, have vaccines. And so you look at the huge costs that's being accrued to the healthcare system today from many who are now getting COVID who don't have vaccines and everyone's paying for that. 
Um, so eventually the community does pay for the libertarian's choice. Uh, the danger, of course, if you go too far down a communitarian perspective, you get into the China experience, you know, China, Hong Kong, or China, Taiwan, Taiwan, to, you know, Tibet and Buddhist, that's very dangerous too. Um, and so it's how you live in this tension, which is not easy. And um, libertarians have to be aware if they begin to reflect on their personal experience, how dependent they are actually in choices they make in which they accept order in which they are then free to enjoy these liberties. Uh, uh, organic Tories just have to recognize under certain situations, the people who Antigone like hold high liberty, at times they can be right. I mean, prophets are often right <laughs> against the crowd. Uh, so how do you live in these tensions? That's where you need the discernment and wisdom of Solomon. Mm. I don't know, does that sort of make sense as an introduction? No, no, I, it's a good analysis. Yeah, it kind of lays out the uh, ways to think about the question. I think it's actually helpful to think about how reliant you are. I kind of think about like the like 1980s and forward, the punk movement where you we had people who were kind of counterculture counter system but the the only way you could be like a successful punk is if you lived on the system so if you were in the uk you'd, you'd probably take the uh, uh social income whatever it was called in the uk i don't know dollop or something but uh and then in, in canada in the us again you'd be living on from family income or, or whatever and yet you were trying to be something of an anarchist which is just sort of impossible <laughs> And if you want to live a healthy, normal life anyways. Well, it's um, contradictory. One of our leading literary people in Canada, George Woodcock, he's from the West Coast, but he saw himself as an anarchist in terms of not um, trusting any authority. And yet the magazine he started on the West Coast was supported by the, by the government, hmm. supported by a publicly funded university. And hmm. so what you get is this theoretical anarchism that's totally disconnected from the way you know, he lived and he, his followers lived and that they were totally funded through taxation from federal provincial government for their, for their magazine. And so it's at a certain point, if there's ideals and then there's practice and if your ideals have nothing to do with your praxis, then you rethink your ideals or you question your praxis, you leave your praxis behind. And so there needs to be some hand in glove fit between what a person claims to believe and how they're actually living. But if they're so separate, then you become sort of a Jekyll and Hyde thinker. I think it's Roger Scruton, Scruton who brings up that a lot of these views are like ideal, they're isms and they're true in idea in, in the mind, they're ideal. But in practice, they never come about. Whereas conservatism, typically because it receives something that's already real and in place, it's able to kind of, I don't know, exist in the real world. Um, might be a good way to transition to, to maybe a, a more blunt question. Uh, is Roger Scruton a good conservative? Uh, I would say he's a first generation liberal. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, go on. Yes. No, I would say Roger Scruton, well, he's conservative in the sense he's conserving the thinking more or less of a Burke, a Smith, a Hume. Um, even his history of the Church of England, it really is, is articulates from the 16th century forward. Hmm. Uh, so both his, his political and economic thinking, as well as his ecclesial thinking, is really 16th century forward. And he's conserving that sort of political economic way, ecclesial way of thinking. And I've done a variety of articles and been on conferences on the Canadian Toryism of a Stephen Leacock and a George Grant versus a Roger Scruton. And I was just last weekend in a conference in the United Kingdom. It was um, Northern, Northern on this very issue. What is conservatism and where does Roger Scruton fit into that? But I would say he's definitely a conservative if you think of conserving first generation liberalism of mm -hmm. the John Locke, the David Hume, the Edmund Burke. Kind the of like life, liberty and property and that that's kind of stuff. right. Yeah, that, that is really, it's liberalism, but as social liberalism has bypassed first gen or second generation liberalism, 
has become more statist and more trendy in terms of its issues, mm -hmm. what's called conservatism today. They're conserving certain views of the family, um, certain views of gender, certain views of identity, also certain views of the market economy and lighter state, the role of society up rather than the state down. And so they slip into this dualism against what they see as the problems of both statism state bureaucracy administration, uh, and also as trendy issues in the culture wars. Um, and so yet again, it's framed as if 16th, 17th century thinking versus 18th, 19th century social liberalism and then postmodern forms of liberalism. But there is a bigger story intellectually in the Western tradition that because of memoricide it then gets ignored. So I would say, I would say uh, Scruton is a conservative in that he's conserving 16th, 17th century liberalism, but he's not a Tory in the old classical sense that you would get in a hooker or in Canada, Stephen Leacock or George Grant or those thinkers. Um, That's fascinating. I, I, wouldn't, I never would have thought that. I mean, I knew that maybe he had uh, different views. I, I, I had a friend who was critical of him because he supported Brexit and all that kind of stuff, but um, that's fascinating. Let me I transition to a last, I, I don't want to go too, too long here for, for your sake. Um, Jordan, so you, you've helped, I think you edited the book, uh, a, a, new, a recent book on Jordan Peterson and an analysis of him published, I think in 2020. Is it by Lexham Press? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'll put the, the link in the show notes and also put your, uh, your high Tory book in the show notes as well. And others, if you're, if you want me to. Um, so, so my question with a guy like Jordan Peterson, and actually might kind of work into the same topic is a lot of people view him as either a sort of champion of, of liberty, so this kind of individualism and all that kind of stuff, or he's kind of demonized as like an old fuddy-duddy conservative. <laughs> it is kind of interesting because he has his whole, you know, shoulders back, clean your room, take individual responsibility. So that's kind of that, that maybe rugged individualism. But then I think when people attack him, they view him they, they call him maybe a conservative in order to associate him with being say racist or something like that. So like, how do you, in this big, this bigger societal question, question that we have, what is Jordan Peterson doing? Where is he? What is he conserving? If he is conserving, is he a first generation liberal or is he something that is a mixture of all these things? Like who is this person in our intellectual history? Yeah, no, lovely point. Exactly. Yeah. There tends to be two reactions, as you probably know, to Peterson. And the book I did on myth and meaning I edited on Peterson was an attempt to transcend the two reactions. There's the one that just demonize him from the liberal establishment mm -hmm. or liberal orthodoxy or, you know, progressivism. As, um, so they tend to demonize, caricature, distort Peterson. Uh, uh, elements on the right tend to genuflect before Peterson, so there's no critical <laughs> right. thinking whatsoever going on. Um, Peterson, I mean, probably important to note, he comes from Alberta. Alberta is our Texas of the North in some ways. With that, I also grew up in Alberta and NBC, so I have oh, a little bit of yeah, so it's, um, but in many ways, I don't know if you ever saw the dialogue we were mentioning, uh, discussing uh, briefly Roger Scruton, the meeting between uh, Peterson and Scruton. Now, Scruton is a much mm -hmm. deeper thinker than Peterson. His cultural analysis, his understanding of the arts and culture and music and religion is far more profound than Peterson. But what they both share, one in a much more substantive way, the other in a suggestive way, is they are in their different ways, as we've talked about earlier, first generation liberals who believe there is a structure to reality. This is where natural law and some um, various philosophers, um, George Grant will grapple with this in his first big CBC lectures in the 50s, Philosophy in the Mass Age. Very important work as an entree or portal into George Grant's thinking from which then Lament for a Nation comes in the mid 60s. But a lot of Peterson's work has been before he was catapulted into public prominence in 216, actually by one of my former students, Lauren Southern, who for many years oh, really? was seen as the yeah, I know, the I know I went for a, yeah. yeah, I went for a long walk with Lauren just last weekend. She's back here from okay. Australia with mom and dad and Gibsons for a while. But um, yeah, Lauren did quite a few. She did a long interview with me. You ever want to look at one of her podcasts? It's uh, hmm. She did a, a lovely interview, and uh, I often get uh, lambasted for having anything to do with her. <laughs> but Lauren has really moved over to a, a thoughtful, increasingly so, center 
Uh, okay. Actually, in some ways more thought, you know, you get some of these great thinkers like a Coleridge and Wordsworth when they're young, they idealize the French Revolution or a Martin right. Buber when he's young, he slips into Herzlian Zionism, but they, they grow out of it. So many people are intense and passionate when they're young, <laughs> they, they say well, and do it, things. It did seem like there's a whole group of people who really jumped on the identitarian yeah. train in like 2018 or so. Yes. I don't know if you've, you probably have like Ellen de Benoist and, and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which I yeah, uh, you have, the, yeah, you have these intellectual fashion shows that they come and go like clouds in the sky. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, to get back to Peterson is um, one of his commitments before really being launched in 216, but after as well, was a turn to myth and whether it's biblical stories of course he did these lectures in genesis in toronto but not only biblical myth but greek myth and scandinavian myth and indian myth and underneath myth of course is the notion there is a structure there is an order and we tell the stories and you see so and so makes these decisions it leads to a cliff edge okay be careful of making certain decisions you know open pandora's box or icarus or uh, you can go on and on with these myths so in an age of post-structuralism there is no order we make up reality as we go along um, the notion there is an order there is a structure and that myths cross civilizations articulate that to us through stories a multiplicity and that's a very conservative notion myth and that's i think why a lot of people get drawn to say lord of the rings or harry potter or chronicles of narnia is there is a story there in which you can make bad decisions and there are consequences a person can compromise their soul there are implications or a person can face into hard challenges and um, they become better for it um, and that's what myths their stories are all about um, and so what he does is he tends to translate those myths into then practical ways people can live, which offends um, uh, certain sort of progressives who, who are you to tell me what, and there is no right or, or wrong at all. It's just perspective and um, different positions. And so what he would share as a classical liberal with Scruton and many others is that there is an order. There are decisions we can make that can cause hurt and harm. And these great stories, comparative mythology across civilizations, is what like C.S. Lewis did in his little book, Abolition of Man. The final, the appendix is on the Tao that looks at all these civilizations have a sense. There is right, there is wrong, and there are consequences for not knowing it. And having an educational system that undermines it as well. And so, uh, Peterson, is a, as I mentioned, he really offended the liberal family compact or liberal orthodox, so, so he became heterodox or a heretic hmm. um, in a form of liberalism that is no more critical thinking liberalism of the best of 16th, 17th, 18th century, but you get this freezing in terms of postmodern liberalism and sort of a laundry list of what the issues a person is expected to assent to and how to interpret those particular issues as well. And as someone who believes in classical liberal critical thinking, he dares to deconstruct sort of liberal orthodoxy. And they don't like that. The Sanhedrin rebels against Peterson as any Sanhedrin does, whether it's first century or whether it's mm. contemporary San intellectual Sanhedrin. So he's seen as a heretic to the tribe. And then of course, of course they can't sort of string him up, but our modern version of that is marginalize them. It's interesting to use the word kind of heresy because it, it does strike me that whatever progressive mode that many people are in today, where there's not really a created or divine or eternal order, you end up sort of divinizing the movement. And so there is a real sense in which heresy is, is like an okay word to use because you are falling away from the, from the true faith, from, from what you ought to be a part of. Um, when you say, so first generation liberalism, you're, you're thinking 16th, 17th, 18th century thinking, Locke and all that. And second generation, is that just kind of what what, what follows afterwards? Is that the way that you're kind of making these, these yeah. distinctions? Yeah, so you increasingly get after that first generation of 16th, 17th century, as you move into the you know 18th, 19th century, the, the whole notion of certain views of liberalism of, you know, the individual and liberty and equality and conscience and choice. What was, of course, was happening is 
um, certain people had more freedom than others who were doing quite well. And so a certain form of second generation liberalism comes along in the economic spheres and says, listen, this is creating an immense economic hierarchy in which people who do very well, and then you have the workers and the laborers who are not doing very well. So we now need unions and we now need a stronger state to put limits on the entrepreneur. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, the last thing you want is unions in a state taxing you higher, you know, insisting on certain working conditions, um, wages, benefits, all of these, these sorts of things. So the second generation liberalism would agree with first generation that liberty is important, but they would also argue in response to first generation that some people have more liberty than others. And if you leave it up to the entrepreneur, it's gonna remain liberty, more liberty for some than the others. So to further the liberal agenda of liberty and individual and equality, you need forces at work like unions in the state to step in and limit the liberty of the strong. So those in the working class uh, and also the rights of women. So you get the whole feminist agenda emerging mm -hmm. at this particular time. And Marx himself is just a leftist liberal, sort of that Hegelian, Hegelian left. He's, he, he's arguing that the, you know, the rights of the bourgeois repress the proletariat. So in the dialectic of history, um, and of course the whole dialectic is about liberty <laughs> at the end, the withering away of the states who all are free. So he uses the language of liberty, but he's on the left side of the liberal story rather than the right story. So increasing you're getting the state mm. uh, moving in, uh, taxing higher, growing bureaucracies and administrative to provide you know, a, a affordable health care, affordable education, um, nationalizing various businesses. So, and so first generation says, whoa, this offends my liberty. So then you get the clash between first generation liberals who feel the state is legislating too much into their private lives and they're fighting back. Uh-huh, against, interesting. Yeah, Marx is, a, is an interesting figure in that I didn't realize this, but he, he really is trying to get freedom. <laughs> so once all the needs are met, well, a free society where everyone can do as they wish because there's no more need to compete and, and fight and all that. Now, as we kind of close down here, I want to ask you um, for some book recommendations. But was there anything that you uh, wanted to to say before that you maybe missed saying or felt like you you didn't say enough on or were hoping for a question for? Yeah, no, I would just say, you know, we've discussed briefly a little bit of um I Toryism and recognizing people that Roger Scroot and Jordan Peterson are not Tories hmm. in that sense, even though I've done a book on them and I have another two essays coming out from Arizona State University on on Peterson. One's called Waking from Woke and the other hmm. is called, um, you know, Biblical Lilliputians Meet Gulliver. And I'm not referring to Peterson as Gulliver and I point from Peterson to Northrop Fry, um, who was at U of T for many years, but at least Peterson, to his credit, moves beyond simplistic literalism when reading the Bible mm. uh, to much more. I mean, there's six layers in the church tradition by which any text was read, and the literal was always the lowest. Then you can move into the tropological, the typological, and what Peterson is doing, a more psychological, uh, um, uh, tropological read. So what's this mean in a person's self-understanding and um, becoming a deeper, more meaningful, more mature person on their life journey or their faith faith journey. But yeah, probably the distinction maybe is that noting that um, even though I've done stuff on Peterson and I do more, um, it, sort of the positive appeal of him, at least he's willing to critique the Sanhedrin. Many are not willing to critique that family compact um, and critical thinking and deacon. We, the liberals talk a lot about deconstructing, but it's you know most deconstructionists don't deconstruct deconstructionism. <laughs> and, and, and to Peterson's credit, he's doing that. And so I use Peterson and Scruton often to point to an older Tory tradition, which Scruton has a much deeper understanding of than Peterson. But they're both in their different ways trying to get beyond. A, a, a trendy avant-garde form of progressivism that lacks any significant critical thinking about most issues. And so, um, so no, no, that's, that, that's lovely. You know, the journey we've walked, there's so many other paths we could travel, but a wonderful interview and thank you. <laughs> no, it's helpful. Thanks. It was just uh, fun to explore and ask some questions from someone who's 
read and understands the issues. Um, I feel like it's a bit of a superpower to actually know the history. Uh, it makes you more persuasive, but also it's more enlightening. And I think a lot of our conflict, some of it has to do with ignorance in the more literal sense, just not knowing, not, not in the pejorative um, or mostly not. So, um, or not. Uh, so th th let me, as we end, uh, can you recommend a couple books on Toryism? Uh, a couple maybe that are not by you and then a couple by you. <laughs> you know, for those who are just feeling their way and picking up little breadcrumbs on the trail, trying to find the pathway home to Toryism, um, I would say George Grant's Philosophy in the Mass Age is a lovely primer in terms of where that's going. I would also see Stephen Leacock, um, his Arcadian Adventures with the Idle Rich. It's a, it's, a, it's a companion novel to Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town. Most people just read Sunshine Sketches. It's a great Canadian classic. But his Arcadian Adventures with the Idle Rich is very, very, um, very good. Uh, I would, uh, as a historian, Donald Creighton is very good, great Tory historian in Canada. Uh, read some of his works on Sir John A. Macdonald, um, great work. The novelist Robertson Davies, uh, some of his trilogies are excellent uh, to read. Um, Eugene Forsey, who is a student of Stephen Leacock, um, great admiration for Leacock. There's another early situation at McGill University is that Leacock was seen as the great conservative. Um, Leacock was probably the most prominent public intellectual in Canada in the first half of the 20th century as Grant was the one of the more preeminent public intellectuals um, in the second half. Leacock was known as a conservative and yet many of the people in the political science department at McGill were the key founders of the CCF, which became the NDP. Mm -hmm. McGill tried to fire them again and again because they offended the business elite in Montreal. And it was Leacock who came to their defense. And so mm -hmm. you have a Tory coming to the defense of leftist mm -hmm. thinkers, which only in Canada can you get. And this is where Howard's with Grant, Red Tory, Leacock with people like Scott and Eugene Forsey and David Lewis and the whole lot of them at McGill. It was Leacock who stood by their side. So we have a very, our history is far more complex in terms of how we understand the good politics, religion than it is the United States because we have what is called the Tory touch. And it's that Tory touch which has done a lot to shape our tensions between liberalism and Toryism, but as Memoricide dominates, people have forgotten what the Toryism is and then they just genuflect to various forms of liberalism. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's helpful. Um, I'll put your your uh, book in our show notes and the Jordan Peterson one that you've edited. Uh, anything on Jordan Peterson other than the than the collected book that you're that you published with Luxem Press? That you could recommend. I would say his most I would say his most important work is Maps of Meaning. Hmm. I mean, what's happened? He's become very popular via his lectures, say on the Bible, or on comparative mythology, or you know his two recent books on rules for living and um, people have reacted either positively or negatively to that. But his more bigger philosophical work is Maps of Meaning that came out in the 90s. Mm. And much of his thinking is just an ongoing uh, application of the theory into the culture wars we face today, who he offends certain people, but he's constantly applying his ideas of myth to the struggles that are going on and how the same myths are being played out by protagonists and antagonists. But I would say um, maps of meaning, if people really want to, you know, deal with the substantive stuff rather than the surface, it's a bit like, you know, his, his more public stuff is like say Erasmus's adages or Tolstoy's children's stories. Uh, you have to write at different levels for different audiences. So at one level, he writes certain books which are very accessible and um, easy to read. But if you want the more sophisticated Peterson, just like if you want the more sophisticated Erasmus or Tolstoy or anyone else, you go to the, you go to the full feast on the table. You don't have little, you know, little desserts that you're nibbling on. Uh, and so a lot of it depends on how deep a person wants to go in terms of someone who's grappling with perennial issues that uh, will be with us as long as the human drama continues. Mm. 
Thanks for the conversation, Ron. That was fun. I feel like I learned okay. a lot and uh, we'll have to be in touch after this. I'll have to ask you questions through email when I read a new book by Scruton or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's an important thinker. I, you know, I have a great admiration for Scruton. I, I don't think he's a classical Tory, but nonetheless, his articulation of aesthetics, the good, the true, the beautiful, uh, his understanding of Wagner, some of the great plays of Wagner, his work on green philosophy, seriously flawed, I think, but nonetheless, he's trying to deal with issues, but he's an essential uh, person to read and, as the Anglicans would say, inwardly digest uh, in, terms of their, in terms of their journey. Prolific writer, I mean, he's, I mean he has a breadth that's um, outstanding, and so I would recommend definitely no, no scruton inside out, but don't, don't uh, take them uncritically either. Mm.